Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Stephanie Parati. I am the director of Shaping EDU, and we have joining us today uh, Dr. Ruben Quintadera, and he is going to walk us through some um, some best and worst case scenarios to <laughs> then challenges to overcome. And, and so, Ruben, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what we're going to be doing today? Certainly. So one of the things, uh, first, let me welcome everybody that is here today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, what I want to talk about today are the challenges that we face when we're trying to source information or reach decisions about what to do with information in noisy times. And unfortunately, you know, we, most decision processes that we go through on a daily basis have some noise to them. But when stakes go as high as they have been during the COVID pandemic, and some of the economic decisions, social decisions, learning decisions for colleges, universities, K-12 institutions around them, the noise level increases. So one of the questions is, can you do things that will bring that noise level down to more manageable? So that's what I want to talk about today, a little bit about tools, techniques that allow us to address that. And we're actually going to both look at them in theory, but also look at them in practice. In other words, I'm going to have you get your hands dirty with a few stages of the process. And also, as you're going to see, have a couple of takeaways so that you can keep playing after we're done here today. So that's the introduction. I'm looking here to see. Oh. Welcome everybody, just thinking well, we give people, so we say one or two more minutes and then we can start. All right, so as I said before, part of the goal of this session is to talk about how you reduce noise uh, in the context of sourcing data and deciding what to do with that data. And the thing about that is that we need to get our definitions a little bit clear before we go any further as to what we mean by noise. And this is the work from Dan Kahneman and his team. Uh, Daniel Kahneman has, uh, a, well, he's a Nobel Prize uh, winner. He has uh, looked extensively at the questions such as uh, how do human beings make decisions, judgments, and so on. And of late, he's been talking quite a bit about the whole question of noise and bias. And this diagram allows us to distinguish uh, what we're talking about. So suppose we're trying to source a piece of information that we would like to be able to act upon. For instance, we might be in a scenario where we have limited resources and we're saying, well, listen, I, I work at this campus. What would be the single thing we could do on this campus that would best benefit the student? population, right? If I have a choice of a certain action. And I would like to get people's input to decide that. And there is, we hope, a you know, fairly clear cut solution. And in case A, it's when everything, opinions, everything I'm harvesting for reaching this decision is accurate. But there are other possibilities. So in case B, this is what we're referring to when we're talking about noisy. In other words, the decisions, what people are proposing, what they're putting on the table, are pretty much all over the map. On average, they would kind of fall uh, within where we want to be at, but they are so dispersed, so far from that center target that we have a problem reaching a decision. I'm going to give you an example in just a second that will make this more concrete, but let's get the Next one, so if you go to C, you have a scenario where it's biased. So everybody is giving you pretty much the same type of answer within the same spectrum, but they're shifted from what would be the actual optimal choice because of biases. And those biases might be introduced by all sorts of sources. They might be introduced by poorly sourced information. They might be introduced by biases, social biases, economic biases, all sorts of biases in how they reach a decision. But whatever it is, what you have some, is now something that's not hitting that target either because it is skewed off to one side. And finally, D is the combination uh, that you can get when you have both noisy and biased. So the average is not coming in where you like it to come in. It's, it's all over the place. And uh, 
it's off to a skew, it's biased to a side, so it's the combination of both. So that's telling you that you really have a problem. And again, in many cases, fortunately, you have some other things constraining this, but that need not be the case. So for instance, suppose you're talking about saying uh, how different instructors might assess the same student's work. And if you have a certain measure for assessment and they all read it the same way, then you're going to get scenario A. But suppose one person says, well, this uh, student made this mistake on the exam, so they're actually doing much more poorly. Another one says, no, I think they're doing quite well, so that's only a minor error. And a third one says, well, I don't care about that one, but I care about this one. You're going to get that noisy scenario. And then for biased, if it's something along the lines of, oh, uh, look, this student has such messy handwriting everybody's going to be off to a side because they are biased by that. And of course, combine the two things and you get both noisy and biased. So that would be the type of scenario in which both show up. And you'd like to see if you can avoid this. So one of the things we need to do is we need to get a little deeper into the sources of noise. So let me show you a diagram from a more recent book that, uh, it's co-authored by Hahnemann and he says, well, look, okay, when you have different sources of you know, distance from what you would like as an accurate result or response to, from whether it's the best way to use a resource on a campus or the best way to assess student learning or you know, some type of reasonable approximation thereof, you have these different sources. And I'm, this is a diagram that's related to the math of this. I'm not going to get very much into the math today in fact, I'm not going into the math at all because that's not required for what we're going to be talking about. But it is important to, again, think of the different sources and how we might want to deal with them. So bias, we have kind of an intuitive notion about. But then uh, Kahneman and his team identify these other three sources, level noise, occasion noise, stable pattern noise. Uh, what are we referring to when we're talking about these? Uh, let's take a closer look at them. So, okay, we already talked about bias, that we have an intuitive notion for. And again, I could delve deeper, but for today, I don't need to really get much. But then you have the whole system noise, all of those things that are adding to those, you know, that dispersion of the uh, assessments or the perception or the decisions that are being taken based on this information. And you have, so all of those form system noise and you have different sources. So the first one is level noise. So this is the variability in average response across multiple cases by different respondents. So I might have to go with that faculty member grading scenario, you might have that one faculty member consistently tends to grade students quite a bit higher than the others. The other one, a little bit less. This faculty member pays more, more attention to this. That faculty member pays more attention to that. Overall, as an average across multiple student uh, scenarios, multiple student responses. So that's what uh, we can call level noise. And then we have pattern noise. And pattern noise uh, has two different sources. So one is stable pattern noise is, for instance, the variability of responses in specific cases by different respondents. And that's more like saying, for this particular student, this, the different uh, faculty responded this way. For this other student, they responded. So it's no longer the average across multiple cases. It's what you're seeing as a pattern within a particular student, within a particular uh, set of faculty members. So that's a stable pattern noise. So that's not an average across cases. That's a case when you're looking at specific, that's what the scenario when you're looking at specific cases. And finally, you have occasion noise, and occasion noise is variability within a set of respondents. And that is one day I look at the student's uh, exam and I say, you know, I had a nice cup of coffee, I went outside, it's sunny, I'm feeling good, I'm gonna give the student a higher score. Next day, it's rainy, it's gloomy, eh, I'm gonna give them a lower score. So that's variability when the self responses by a respondent. And there are all sorts of things that could trigger that. I just gave you one, maybe it's the weather, maybe it's uh, because one day I'm rushed, the other day I have plenty of time. So that's occasion noise. If you will, it's a point at which you could say that I'm disagreeing with myself at different points in time. So these are all sources of noise. So we have bias, we have noise. And again, one of the questions is, how do we deal with this? 
And there are multiple approaches. And if you read uh, Tenement's uh, book, uh, you're going to see multiple approaches, multiple ways of dealing with this. But today I want to focus particularly on one approach that's easy to implement and reasonably fruitful. And that's why it's been used for a variety of scenarios. So it's what's called the modified Delphi approach. The modified Delphi approach says, look, we have all these people who bring information to the table about a decision that's going to be reached, something that's going to be chosen, a particular set of consequences to this, et cetera. Is there a way that we can get them to aggregate their knowledge, but in such a way as to reduce both noise and bias? That's our golden approach. Now, the first thing somebody says, yeah, sure, get them all in a room, have them debate it out, uh, maybe brainstorm it and uh, something will come out. Yeah, unfortunately that doesn't work <laughs> most of the time to reduce noise and bias. Why? You get the loudest voice in the room phenomenon among many others. So you have somebody who may have exactly the wrong idea, may actually have no idea how to properly assess what that student is doing, but man, are they loud. And man, are they persuasive. So everybody by the other said, sure, whatever. Just to get out of that room, they won't get out. Or maybe they're right, but they're so loud and obnoxious that everybody says, no, they can't be right because they're loud and obnoxious. That can be it. Or you have different people and everybody takes time arguing. Again, I'll invite you to look at some of the deliberations, public deliberations that have taken place in health organizations, in learning organizations around COVID. And I'm sorry to say, you're going to see this phenomenon in full blast. You're going to see everything from people leaving the room saying, I voted this way, being asked, well, why did you vote that way? And not frankly being too sure why they voted a certain way, why they chose to do something with classes or to do something with a vaccine or something like that. And you ask them to try to tease it apart. And they said, well, I wound up voting this way because this other person was being so loud and I was worried that they were just going to run away with it. So I felt the need to counterbalance them. Again, you can see immediately how you're going to get those shotgun patterns, if you will, that I showed you earlier that don't really give you uh, that type of convergence. Yeah, Tom said groupthink, absolutely. And, and again, the, the thing is, there are many, many variations on this. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, why if you use structured discussions? And the answer is, there are ways of doing that. And maybe in another session, I'll get to some of how you can do it. But the truth of the matter is, it's quite difficult. And it's quite difficult because we are very susceptible to simple things, such as how loud somebody is. Do they push themselves forward or do they hold back? Uh, just uh, all of those other things we bring to the table about past experiences with people and so on. But, but let's assume I do have round the table the people that I would like to have contributing to this. How do I bring what they're thinking about, what they're doing in such a way that it's giving me but I'm showing you here as a nice little dotted line. There's this relevant knowledge. This would be the bullseye of those targets I was showing you before. How do I get them to bring all their knowledge to the table so that what results is this? So this is what we're going to go through in, as I say, this Delphi process, this modified Delphi. I'll explain why it's a modified Delphi in just a second. But uh, the original Delphi process was created uh, back in the 60s by a set of researchers, mostly associated with RAND, although not just at RAND, who were worried about this. They were worried about things in very critical scenarios. They were worried about things along the lines of decisions associated with public policy, decisions associated with war. One of the main concerns was, are we seeing people make really bad decisions at that point in the context of Vietnam because of bad uh, decision-making processes, bad deliberations, where everybody says, well, we had this discussion. I said, yes, but we made a terrible decision at the end of the day. So that's why the process occurred. And they said, well, look, this is a process for detaching the knowledge that people bring to the table from how they integrate it, how it's shared. Now that method, the original Delphi method is very powerful, but it's time consuming. 
expensive in terms of the amount of time of people take. So modified Delphi techniques say, can we aggregate this knowledge without those issues, without those problems? So let me show you how this is going to work. And again, we're going to go through it, but you're going to have the experience at different points. So the first thing is, okay, I need to seed the field. So I bring expert A. Now expert A is going to have some overlap with this target, but they think because of their biases, their internal noise generation patterns, et cetera, that it's over here. I bring expert B and they think it's over there. And I bring expert C and they think it's over here. And now if I bring in enough experts, notice what's happening. If I add it together all of their experiences, that core that I want to get at, it's there, all right. But man, oh boy, oh boy, there, there, there's so much extra stuff there. There's so much around that core that it's going to be very hard to get at it. So we need, we first have to start by seeding the field, get everybody to put all the stuff that they think is part of this core out there but we're gonna to have to do something to narrow it down. And we wanna make sure that the experts aren't doing this in such a way as to be biased by others. So this is not the sort of thing you gather people around the table and say, okay, what do you think should be here? The minute you do that, expert A is going to be too shy to share some of the stuff that they think should be there because expert B is much better known in the field and expert C is just a loud mouth and people think that, but the expert C isn't listening to other people, even though they really do have relevant knowledge. So we need to get them to see the field a little differently. How do we do that? I'm going to have you go through the exercise now that I would do to see the field. If I wanted this question, this question is the following. What are the essentials, technological tools, pedagogical frameworks, et cetera, that all faculty, and this is uh, applicable across K-12 or higher ed, et cetera, that any faculty in your thinking, your experience should have in their toolkit so as to support their students learning, okay? So you have a link there on that page. Let me explain how this is going to work. I don't want you to debate this in the chat. I don't want you to get together in groups to talk about it. I want each of you to come at this as an expert. I want you, each of you as an expert to just add as many responses as you like there in that survey uh, until we have enough to cover what we need to maybe get at the next stage. In other words, have that big blob of answers, all right? And one of the reasons, as I say, that I want you all to do that is because I think you all bring something valuable to the table. The aggregate is going to be much, much bigger than that target we want, but this is where we're going to start, all right? And you might ask, by the way, why did you pick that question, Ruben? Yeah, that's a great question. Another session I did on Delphi, modified Delphi processes, that question came out from a process where we were trying to determine, so what should be the key questions we should be asking ourselves in order to support better uses of technology in education? And this rose to the top as a result of a modified Delphi process, as one of three key questions that uh, learning design, learning experience designers, technology support people, faculty, et cetera, like, uh, faculty leaders should consider or keep in mind in order to achieve that goal. So in fact, the question you're seeing, is it in and of itself the result of a Delphi process? So I'm gonna give you here just a couple of minutes and let's say, let me give you three minutes, all right? And while you're typing in there, if anybody has questions, type them in the chat and I'll be happy to uh, Can I ask them. a quick clarification on the question on the form? Please do, please do it, Tom. Yes. It says, it says uh, please choose an item you see as being one of these essentials. Is there a list somewhere or do we- No, 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 choose from your, sorry. I should, that's choose from your own personal experience. From the things that okay. you think are these essentials, just choose one and you can put as many as you want, just do one per round. So it'll put one, submit the form, it'll give you, okay, you wanna submit another? Go ahead and submit another. Okay, Keep I was going. just wanting to make sure I wasn't missing a list somewhere. There I will be a list, that. lists will come, but not just yet. Again, remember at this point, <laughs> this is as open as possible. I'm getting this blobulated, if you will, aggregate of everybody's experience 
into the picture. Got it. Okay, all right. So again, you'll know, also notice that I am being very neutral. I didn't give you any examples of this. Why? Because if I give you examples, you are going to immediately be steered by my examples. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but if at all possible, just try to simply say, okay, give examples of the category rather than examples of the specific. Again, this is going to be more powerful. So again, I'm just gonna say, let's go for two more minutes perhaps. And while you're doing that, let me just very quickly, go just make one quick change to my setup at my end, if you'll excuse me, just one second. I'm gonna turn off my own video for one second so I can switch power supplies to my laptop because it does not appear to be charging. And I wanna make sure we don't have an unscheduled interruption. That's even more disruptive than noise and bias in decision processes. So while you're doing that, I'll be right back. All right, much better. Moral of this story, always make sure you look at the battery indicator in your main bar. All right, so again, uh, so can you like blobulate it? Thank you. I, I, I'm not sure I can take credit for that. I'm pretty sure I've heard it elsewhere, but I'm glad you like it. It's the best board of the day. Right, so while you're doing that, let me just take a quick peek and see how responses are coming along. Very nice, very, very nice indeed. I'm not, again, I'm not going to say anything about what the responses are other than I'm very pleased with uh, what I'm seeing come out. So part of what's happening here, just because I can say this without actually uh, biasing things is this is the equivalent of what some people would say, well, this is the goal of brainstorming, et cetera, except that the usual scenarios for brainstorming, again, do tend to produce noise and bias. So this is, if you will, a get what's in your mind as an expert, get what's in your mind as a professional, if you will, out there. But once again, trying to get the good stuff, what people think about when they think about doing brainstorming without the bad side, which is the introduction of noise and bias. All right, let me see, has the flow slowed down? Yes, all right. So thank you very much. I'm gonna give you the last uh, 10 seconds to type in any last minute responses. So 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, thank you very much. We're done, I'll go ahead and close out the survey. And to give you an idea, we have with right now 17 participants, but uh, Laura, Stephanie and myself are of course neutral here because we don't want to bias things. Uh, so with effectively 14 participants, so submitting responses, we have 53 responses. And just a quick look, I'm seeing things like active learning, community of inquiry, emotional intelligence, I'm gonna scroll down, uh, transparent assignments, Socratic discussions and understanding of the brain. There's a huge list here. All right, now, what would happen next? Let's get back to our process here. If I were doing this in just one second, uh, one single pass, okay. Uh, what we're looking at is 
say, okay, now I would say, uh, so we're going to look at this list. We're going to eliminate duplicates, right? Several people did submit uh, several of these uh, as would be expected. And also we're going to regularize things like how something is stated or a spelling in other words, so that we don't have 20, uh, 20 variations of what is essentially the same thing. So for instance, if we say active learning, somebody wrote active learning and another person says to use active learning and a third person uh, writes use active learning. Those are not three separate things. We would probably summarize all three under the single heading active learning, but that takes a little bit of time. If we were doing this over the course of a day, what we would do is we'd continue with this. We would come back after lunch and we would do the next phase. Because we don't have that much time today, what we are going to do is all those of you who signed up are going to get a link to this. Uh, once this has happened, I'm going to finish cleaning this up, etc., and you'll be able to take the next steps on this material that you sourced. Well, that's one of the things, by the way, that I try to do whenever I do a session. I try to honor the work that people did. I don't want to throw it away. You will put this forward as the essentials. I want to give you the opportunity to finish the Delphi process on this. But let's see what we would do if we already had this list. So we have the list and we have it all together. And so you have here the big blob. OK, so we've aggregated the list. We've cleaned it up, we've eliminated duplicates, we've made sure everything's in the same format. And we have this as a result, the big blob of expertise. But what we want is not the big blob, it's just too big. Okay, you could say, well, anything in this itself. Yeah, but uh, you all gave me 53 different replies. Even if I assume there's a fair bit of duplication there, there's roughly probably, a, oh, you know, there's gotta be somewhere on the order of 40 replies or so by the time it's all cleaned up and so on. That, that certainly isn't something I can easily act on if I'm trying to prioritize this list. And there might be some replies that frankly are all the way out on the left upper fringe there of expert A and nobody else remotely thinks that that's an important or relevant thing. So we need to winnow this down. How are we gonna winnow this down? Well. One of the things I would do now is I would say, okay, we have these, and here's some information about each of the replies that's on the table. So one of the things that we would do is we would have, for instance, links to each of the replies. So if somebody put active learning, there will be a link to a source or multiple sources on active learning. If somebody put down challenge-based learning, we might include a link to challenge-based learning, et cetera. So those are some of the things that you would do in terms of informing the process. But again, remember, this is different from lobbying, okay? This is not, oh, here, you must see how important what I put there is. It's a question of saying, okay, people have put this out there. Here are a set of resources that will inform this. In the, ver in the shortened version we're going to do, I'm not going to add links, but just so you know that in many cases, this is what you would do at this stage. In other words, make sure that, particularly because something that expert A put on the table might be of interest to expert C, they just happen to never hear about it. You're going to get some information out there about the process, but this is links. And again, I want to emphasize that it is not a lobbying process or a stack the deck process. It's a process whereby Everybody can look at one of these options that were this big blob source from the experts and say, oh, okay, I get what they're talking about. So that's what we have here. Uh, so looking quickly in the chat, I know this, uh, Carolyn is correct. Standardized verbiage is indeed correct. So we have standardized verbiage. If needed, we are going to inform this. Now we need to winnow this down. How are we going to do this? Well. One of the things we'd like to do is to be able to say, can we at least get people to select a core that still is not the tight core that we want, but to have a sort of agreement core that we say, well, we know it doesn't need to be the whole big blob. It can be this smaller subset that we know contains the core. So how do you go about doing that? Well, what you want to do is to go through a process where people say, you know what? There are so many choices here on the table. Let's pretend for a second that there are 49 choices, okay? I'm going to select out of those, the ones that I as expert A think are most important. 
Export B is going to do the same. Export C is going to do the same. So it's not going to be the whole set, hopefully. Uh, it's going to be some subset. So it's going to be that darker blue circle around the dotted line. But one of the questions is, uh, how do I get there so that eventually I'll be able to further that and go in a second round and say, okay, now we're going to winnow this down to the second. Well, there's a question of saying how you go about doing this. And this is part of the element of modified Delphi processes. What you're going to do is you're going to get that big list. It's been cleaned up. So the verbiage is standardized. There's no repetition. There's no duplicates. If necessary, there will be information to make sure that you know what all the elements on the list are. But now you have a voting map. So each of the experts, each of the participants gets a certain number of tokens to distribute among their preferred replies. How many votes should I give participants? This is a matter where we can bring in theoretical mathematics, we can bring in simulation, and we can bring in experience. But at the end of the day, one of the best ways to do this is to say, look, if you have 49 options, you don't want 49 votes because otherwise then you're just gonna have the original people. On the other hand, one vote is too little. You're just not going to get necessarily that larger circle from which you're going to pick your target. What turns out to work mathematically and in actual practice over the years that you know, people have been doing this, including my own experience, is to take however many replies you have, take the square root of the number of replies and give those to your participants as the number of votes they have to invest in the list and choosing from that list what that smaller core is going to be. So I said, if I have 49 choices, square root of that, seven. So I give seven tokens to each participant to distribute. So that's the first thing. That allows us to tighten things without over or under tightening. And, and again, if anybody's interested, you know, I can uh, you know, talk a, another time about uh, the number, you know, why the square root and why it works really well. But in a certain sense, you can think of as throwing darts. And if you were doing this mathematically, uh, you'd find that the, a, if you simulated this and you said, okay, so you have a reasonably good rough idea of where you're at because of that diagram. That's about the number of darts that you need to uh, have that first circle be constructed, square root. Uh, Laura asked in there, do I round down? No, I just run to the nearest number of, uh, the nearest number of votes for the square root. So if this were, you know, say if this were instead of 49, if it were 48, it would still round to seven. And if it were, conversely, I also don't round up. So if it's a little bit, if it were something like, instead of, uh, say, if it, instead of being 36 or 37, that's six and a bit, but it's still rounded to six. So I'll be honest with you. In many cases, the difference turns out to not be huge, whether you round up or not. But they, I, I find that just rounding to the nearest number, whether it's up or down, is what works best. All right. So, OK. So, so far, you have the number of votes. But what are you going to do with them? And again, the question here is, do you want them vote, everybody voting for seven different things? But the answer is no, hold on, you want to use that expertise. And here's where I can say, well, okay, so there's this list of 49 things. I'm really quite sure that this one is important. I'm pretty sure this other one could be too, and I'm less sure about this one, but I'd still like to count the well you want some way of factoring that in. So it's not just they put a vote on everything regardless of how much they care about it or regardless of how they feel about it. You want them voting on the things that they want. They feel as most relevant, most important to be higher on the list than the others. So the way you can do this then is to take that square root number of tokens and to distribute the tokens among the replies any way they want. They can put one token, on each of seven different replies. So they say, okay, I, there are seven different things. I can't really choose which one is more or less important. I'm just gonna put one token on each of these seven things because I think all seven should be, make it to the next round. On the other hand, I have, oh no, I think there's this one thing. I think this one thing is crucial, absolutely essential. 
So I'm going to take all seven of my tokens and I'm going to put it on one. Or then I'm going to distribute it, you know, two on this, one, four on another, one on a third, because those that's the relative importance I attribute to each of these. And another important thing, the voting is private. This is not a show of hands. One of the things that I found very distressing, I'll be honest with you, in terms of some of the decision-making during the pandemic is the number of people that report over and over again in health scenarios, in education scenarios, that they felt pressured in their vote by the fact that the vote was public. So this is crucial, that the voting is private, nobody else gets to see it. Otherwise, we start seeing all those noise and bias generation mechanisms on the table again. And then after we do this, we're going to say, okay, these were the top T replies as a result of this. So we're going to select them for the second round of voting. And it's several replies tied for last place also be included. So say I had seven, but two tied for that last place. Well, instead of seven and eight, go to the next round, okay? So again, you should have always at least T replies, but you may have one or two more if several replies died for last place. And that's important to keep in mind. You should always include rather than exclude. In other words, if you have say nine replies because three replies tied for last place, that's fine. Keep all nine for the second round. Don't reduce it uh, by three. In other words, to just four replies in the last one, okay? so. That's what we have so far. Now, at this point, I've been talking about this. Again, time for experiential learning. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a list. Now, this is not a list that you came up with. As I say, well, unfortunately, we don't have enough time for you to use that list. We're going to use a list that I've seen actually used quite a bit in education these days. Uh, and this is a list of challenges facing higher education. Uh, this is the uh, Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, APLU. And they did this survey originally in 2019. And they've repeated it since in 2020 and 2021. And the same items seem to come to the foreground. This is the full, this is the most complete list. Sometimes you'll see in the press either the top three or the top 10. I'll tell you right now, the list is interesting. But the mechanism by which you select the top three or the top 10 you know everything I said about noise, bias, etc. Welcome to noise, bias, etc. So this is something I would say, let's assume the list is not half bad. Let's assume that their experts did a pretty good job. Now I don't have at the table the 400 plus people that were consulted for the APLU survey. So I, but I'm going to ask you to all stand in their stead. And I'm going to ask you, okay, we have 18 items here. So the square root of 18, all right, that's just uh, gonna be around four tokens. All right, so I'm gonna round it to four tokens. And I'm going to ask you to look through this list and then you have the tiny URL there. Thank you, Laura, for putting that in the chat again. And then survey number two, and you're going to see how you do the four tokens. So you can put all four tokens on one, you can distribute it on four, three on one, one on another, up to you. So as to give you a bit of time, I'm just going to go through the list and go very quickly read through it. It's just in alphabetical order. It is not in any way, shape or form ranked in any way by the numbers, of how, who voted for how many, what the numbers changed between 2019 and 2020. It's just alphabetical order. I even prefer to completely randomize because of some slight biases that occur with alphabetical order, but I'm okay with at least having this so you're not inheriting already the noise and biases of the original group if I just put it in ranked order. So academic freedom, freedom of speech, again, equality, affordability, competition from non-traditional post-secondary programs, decrease in high school student population, diversity and inclusion of students, faculty, and staff, evolving workforce needs for graduates, government funding, graduation rates, international enrollment, K-16 partnerships, rankings, research security, serving non-trad students, sexual assault harassment, student enrollment, student mental health and well-being, and student success and retention. So those are the 18 items. They're all fairly self-explanatory. And again, they were framed in the context of challenges facing higher education. So I turn to you and I say, the list, the raw, that big blob of experience was sourced by somebody else. 
I'm putting you with the task of coming up with the inner circle of them. All right. So you've got the link. You've got the voting. We have, da, 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 I should expect 18 votes or so. By the way, Laura, Stephanie, I, if either of you or both of you want to participate, by all means do. I, I did not mean to exclude either one of you last time. It was more I wasn't expected. In other words, I know you've got other, other managerial things to keep the whole Zoom chat going and so on. So I didn't want to put you under pressure. But if you'd like to contribute or vote, by all means do. Uh, Kelly says, uh, Mural is a great collaboration tool that allows for and all other functions in private mode. I agree. It, absolutely, it's a great tool. And I, today I'm just using Google Forms simply because it's dead easy and free. And you know a, anybody who has ever used Google Forms, you can look at these samples I put out and say, okay, there, there's, you know, I can make a tutorial about it, but it would be the most boring tutorial in the world because it's, you know, just make, you know, in the first case, just make a simple short reply entry. In the second one, it's just make four multiple choice questions. That's it. If you feel like it, you can use pull downs. There are pros and cons. I've used both pull downs and multiple choice. If you're curious, I find multiple choice works better when people are less familiar with the list and then it's about a longer list. With really short lists, I find the pull down sometimes works better, but that's yeah, that's details, frankly. It, it really doesn't affect the workings of the whole thing. But if you have Mural, absolutely, I agree, Kelly. Great tool, absolutely a great tool. Uh, I'll also mention that several people at different points have written, including myself, uh, apps to do Delphi processes. And all I'm going to say is with a certain tinge of bitterness, never, ever, ever write anything in Flash. Uh, nowadays, of course, uh, yeah. Exactly, Laura. It's nowadays, of course, that's self-explanatory since it no longer exists. But uh, those of us who remember, oh, it will always be supportive. It's like, yeah, didn't quite work out that way. But okay. So let me see how replies are going. One second, and let's see if we can move to the next stage here now. Okay, pretty close to it from the looks of it. So I think we have a couple of people who haven't replied. So let me just give you a few more seconds. Uh, Laura, you'd be interested in math? Absolutely. And as I say, it's a, it's a fascinating challenge because uh, for those of you who like Laura are interested in the math, one of the challenges here is you are making some assumptions about the distribution of expertise and the distribution of experts. So the distribution of within that, my individual blob, how is that expertise distributed? How much of it is peripheral versus closer to the core? And then among all the people I bring to the table, how are they distributed? And the simplest assumption I can make is it's some type of a bell curve uh, like thing. And that's one way of doing it. But you can also say, can I study for specific scenarios? If I assume that there's going to be a certain bias and I have other data that allows me to assume a very different distribution, could I tweak that in the number of votes? And the answer is yes. So absolutely, I, I'd be delighted to discuss some of the math involved. All right, I think we're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the voting then. So going three, two, one, done. All right. And now, of course, what I have is a big spreadsheet, but very quickly, oh, very interesting. I'm going to say diversity and inclusion is clearly showing up as one of the key top items. I'm also seeing, oh, let me see what's what we're looking at here. Uh, K-16 partnerships are showing up. So again, at this point, I would have to do the math. It would take me a little while and I'd rather save time for Q&A and for you to see the last stage of a Delphi process. So all of you who registered for this, you will be receiving the final, what were the top four results from this? It does take a little while because I need to look at the spreadsheet and make sure that I, that all the counting is working correctly. But again, uh, for instance, competition from non-traditional is also showing up as one of the likely top uh, 
uh, items, etc. Tom mentioned small sample size alert. Absolutely, Tom. But one of the things I always point out to people is it's a question of what's the appropriate size. If I work at a very small college, liberal arts institution, or a small school, a small sample size may be appropriate because that's my faculty body, that's my teaching body. If I'm working in a district and there's you know a, a couple of dozen say uh, support uh, personnel for curricular development and so on, it's a small sample, but it's appropriate to what they're looking at. So thank you. So what you've done now is you've effectively winnowed down. Let me get back to my slides here. You've winnowed down that list to a final set, and I'll send you what that final set looks like for with the last four choices, so you can chew over it and ponder it. But what I want to do now is give you the final step, so you can actually take this and do this at home. So uh, unlike all those shows that say don't try this at home, do try this at home, please. That's what I'm hoping that you'll do as a result of this. And what you need to do now is to say, take that larger disk and get it down to that dotted line disk. And this is the second round. And the second round looks very much like the first, except that every participant now gets the number of a square root of T tokens to distribute among their preferred replies. So my example, I had T tokens or T replies from the previous round. So now the square root of seven is approximates two, six something. So it's about three, okay? In our case, I'll have to see if there are any ties, but if there are no ties, you're going to get two tokens for, from a t equals four. If there are several ties, it could go up to three, although I'm kind of doubtful it's going to be that. Could be though. So the bottom line is whatever number you have left over, uh, whatever number sorry, you have that were selected for round two of the replies, they take the square root of that for the number of tokens. That's mathematically the most robust method. I'll, mess, I'll mention a second method in just a second that you can use, but that's mathematically more robust. And as in the previous voting round, this participant can distribute their tokens any way they want. So they could put one token on each of three different replies, pull three tokens on one reply, put two tokens on one reply and one token on a second reply. And as before, voting is private. And what you're going to come out with are the top three or top n, whatever. In this case, it's three. In the case you've been working on, it will most likely be two, although it could be three if, if there's a tie there. But the key thing is that people ask me is, well, okay, but if the previous disk was narrow enough, why do you need to do the second round? Isn't it good enough? You know, see, see at this point you want to say, Ruben, we're, we're happy with four replies. That's good enough. Why do you want to narrow it further? I said, well, because of this. Suppose expert B, name the whole series of uh, possibilities and not a single one of them made it to that list for the second round. Now, you could say, well, maybe expert B has nothing to bring to the table, but that's probably not it. If you look at what's happening there, you say, well, expert B had all of their primary replies eliminated, but now they can look at the remaining replies and bring their expertise to bear on those. In other words, none of their primary choices survived, but they can still bring something to the table that is valuable and useful in terms of making that final choice. So that's why you always want to do at least two rounds. Even if after round one, you think, well, it's small enough. I realize that that means that sometimes you're going to wind up with a smaller subset than you might like. But strictly speaking, if you want to get the maximum mileage out of Delphi, if you want to make sure that you really do get that blobulation aggregation into that nice target core. That's what you want to do. So that's the first thing I'll mention. The second thing I'll mention for the second round method is sometimes you'll see instead of uh, using the square root method that people say, well, look, I have three action items I want to get to. So let's say you're looking at that list of challenges. I have money. I have been funded by the X foundation to address these three the three challenges that result from this, and I need exactly three. You can, instead of having the square root of n, just put three and do that uh, there. But it is, well, it works, and it does bring most of the benefits of Delphi to the table. It is less robust mathematically. So the most robust mathematically is the square root. If you have a need for a specific number, it's okay to do it, but do keep in mind that sometimes it'll be too small 
sometimes it will be too large. So you'll introduce a little bit of noise and bias as a result, okay? If it doesn't match up, obviously. If it matches the score root, great, you're, you're home free. So that's the one thing to keep in mind, but it's usually, usually what I would call good enough for the work you need to do. You've already done enough of the good work. Uh, Tom asks, is there a mechanism for adding also runs from the first round back in during round two? No, that's a crucial aspect. If it's gone, it's gone. In other words, uh, there's no way for you to do the also runs, et cetera, because that means that they were outside that larger, the disc, not the dotted disc, okay? If I, uh, let me see that. Here we go. If you look here, okay, not the dotted disk, but that cyan disk. If it got left out of that disk, it simply isn't going to be in that dotted disk. So there is no mechanism for having also rants because they, they shouldn't be there. Some people say, ah, but what if something because somebody was ill that day? So at some point, as soon as you start doing that, we're straight back in noise and bias territory. You're better off saying something got omitted because of that, then by including a mechanism for refactoring it in, so suddenly re-pouring in all the blobulation in there. And there is no good mathematical justification, I'll add for that, uh, to that, that would allow you to say, well, this one should be included and that one not, because suddenly you start getting into very tricky questions as to the things that were marginal in the first one. All right, a second, second round also, also again, Tom, not designed for that. Again, mathematically, you, you have to keep thinking, the also rants don't matter. The also rants are out of that central disk. They're out of the dotted disk, discard them. There is no, because the choice mechanism has nothing, says nothing about those also rants. Uh, the selection, I, I know people like to do this and they keep saying, well, what about being fair or what about, that's the wrong way to look at it. All you're doing at that point is you're adding noise. You're, not, you're really not adding information. Uh, this to, has nothing it, to do with being fair. It's about identifying the one crazy idea that actually turns out to be the smart one that none of very, the group sees. Uh, Black very Swan idea. Uh, yeah. yeah, very rarely. <laughs> okay, we can get into how likely that idea is to show up and not be. Interestingly enough, the crazy idea is more likely to show up in the dotted disk if it has that capability than not. In other words, if it's what you're talking about, uh, Tom, is an idea that's completely outside the experience of the blobulation aggregation, and that can exist, of course, but then you need to go to completely different methods. There's nothing useful here that will allow you to get at that. And we can talk about sourcing for that type of scenario, but this is more one of the reasons that, let me mention something right now that I was going to say for the closer, but I'll say it right now. One of the beauties of the Delphi process is not only does it allow you to eliminate noise, not only does it allow you to get at that dash disk, which contains the key information you need to act upon. Because of how it aggregates things, it also is a consensus building. And also people say, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't get my contributions to the blog as the final one but I can see that the process yields something that we that aggregates the knowledge of the group. It doesn't feel like somebody shoved this through or somebody put this and it's only their pet project. In other words, the process is perceived to be fair as a result. And some unbelievably difficult decisions have been made by this. I'll give you an example, the decision of what is to count as analytic uh, thinking by the American Philosophical Association was done by a Delphi process. Not, not this type of modified, but it was a Delphi process. And part of the reason was any debates, any discussions never got anywhere, never. And the Delphi process was able to produce something that perhaps nobody was perfectly happy with, but that everybody agreed, aggregated the knowledge of the American Philosophical Association as an expression of what analytic thinking is. So that's it for the basic Delphi, but I wanna leave you with a teaser for next time. The teaser is, I asked all the questions around one dimension. So we aggregated questions in your responses, you aggregated responses about technology, teaching methods, etc. 
But what if that's like this timetable I'm showing you here? This is just the first 25 rows, or 24, uh, 23 rows, sorry, of Lufthansa's timetable between any two cities for Lufthansa's uh, freight in Europe. If I try to view that as a sort of one dimensional object, that wouldn't work because the distances, the times of flight, et cetera, are given by two dimensions. The method I just showed you works well when you're using it in one dimension, but are there ways of separating out dimensions? Are there ways of getting at and saying, well, look, maybe there's one set of priorities for technologies and one set of priorities for learning scaffoldings. How will we get at that? Hey, we'll do that in a later session. All right. So for now, that's uh, what I wanted to show you. At the end of this, you have a method that is robust against noise. It's robust against bias. Is it perfect? No, no method can be perfect. Choose a bad group of experts and you're going to get a bad reply. But if you're reasonably broad in who you bring to the table, inclusive, if you reasonably make sure the constituencies that are relevant to the questions you're asking are represented, then you have a method that is very robust against uh, noise. It's very robust against bias. And as I say, at the end of the day, in addition to providing a result that you can act upon, it also allows you to say, hey, everybody contributed and nobody just made it their pet project. All right, so we have just one or two minutes left. Any questions that people would like in the chat? So I'm seeing avoiding grouping, assigning devil's advocate, absolutely, Alexander, and some very interesting questions as to you know how you use the devil's advocacy one. It's it's a little, it, it can be very tricky if you're, but that's for again different methodologies. Uh, oh, thank you, Kelly. Glad you like it. Laura sensing a T-shirt opportunity. Uh huh. Go ahead, please. I I, I, I welcome t-shirt opportunities. So that sounds very good. Okay, so thank you, Kim. I'm glad you found it interesting. So any other questions or comments? One thing I am going to tell you is uh, I have references here for some of the materials, etc., And I'm going to post the slides to my blog, which you see here at the top. I'll also make sure that whenever, it, you know, when you get the next mailing about this, you'll also have a link to the slides. So you have all the materials as well as reference materials, et cetera, that I've cited. All right. So thank you all. It's really been a pleasure having you here. I'll stick around for a little while longer. If there's any questions, again, don't be shy. Type them in the chat. And I'll see you all, well, hopefully at the next Shaping EDU event. Thank you.